We're going to move on now to uh, Dr. Beth Mitchum. She's in the Department of Plant Sciences. She's also a Cooperative Extension Specialist here at UC Davis. And she'll be talking about strawberry handling at retail and food service operations and how to preserve quality and shelf life. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Beth. Great. Thank you, Jim. Well, good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're located. Um, I want to take you back just for a minute to the end of Jim Thompson's presentation. He left us at the D.C. where we were taking the pallet covers off and uh, placing the strawberries in storage at 32 degrees. Of course, we need to get them from the D.C. to our retail outlet, whether it's food service or a supermarket. And, of course, many of the principles that Jim spoke about in terms of cooling the trailer to 32 degrees prior to loading, use of a refrigerated loading dock whenever possible, uh, loading the strawberries away from the walls, all of these same recommendations will hold for transporting that product to the retail outlet. When the product does arrive, of course, you uh, need to do an inspection and account to make sure you're getting what you're expecting and to check for quality. Uh, because strawberries are so sensitive to temperature, we don't want to be doing that inspection in a warm location, certainly not outside in the sun, and even in the back room is, is not preferable. Uh, if at all possible, the fruit should be immediately offloaded into the cooler, and the inspection uh, should take place at those lower temperatures. And part of the reason the inspection um, is important not only just to assure that the visual quality you're getting meets your expectation and the, the count is correct, uh, but if you do see any evidence of decay, it's a great idea to um, to remove decayed berries, uh, assuming that you're not in a uh, situation where you would reject the product, depending on where it's coming from. Uh, but it, you want to remove those decayed berries because um, botrytis, which is the main decay organism in strawberries, will spread from fruit to fruit. And so if you can get out um, just those few decayed berries, sometimes you can save a, a larger problem later on. So we've heard a lot about the effects of uh, temperature on strawberries, and I want to just, um, with a few slides, talk a little bit about the biology of strawberries and why temperature is so important. Part of the reason, uh, well, first of all, temperature is the key to quality and certainly to final customer satisfaction and um, greater sales. Part of the reason is that um, the higher the temperature, the higher the respiration rate of the fruit. So it's just like the, the metabolic rate of the fruit. So, and, and the faster the metabolic rate, the more heat the fruit themselves will produce and the shorter their post-harvest life will be or their shelf life. The other uh, issue is that the higher the temperature, the faster the rate of water loss. Water loss will eventually lead to shrivel. But it's really important to recognize that you can have water loss occurring at some rate from the time you harvest the berries until they're consumed. And it's only when a certain critical level of water loss is achieved that you actually will see shrivel. So you may see fruit that looks very uh, turgid and, um, and bright, but within a short period of time, which is a little more water loss, they can show shrivel. And so that's why you want to be uh, keeping the temperatures cold uh, at every step along the way. And then the third factor is uh, decay development. Uh, the, the mold growth that I just showed you will occur at a much faster rate at higher temperatures. So the cooler we can keep the fruit, the more we can slow the growth of that decay. Um, and you know, we mentioned earlier that in the pallet uh, shrouds, you'll have a higher temperature, and, and part of the reason for that is from the respiration and the heat production that comes from the fruit themselves. So really at every step along the way, from the time we harvest the fruit, uh, we want to try to reduce exposure to warm temperatures. This is just a, a lovely photo of the two main characters that cause decay of strawberries, uh, Botrytis cinerea on the left and Rhizopus stilotifer on the right. So in terms of maintaining temperatures at the retail, uh, the walk-in cooler is a, a key area. And of course, this cooler, usually it's no, nowhere near big enough and it has to accommodate a wide range of products that have different temperature needs. And so that's a challenge to start with. Um, you want to um, have the set point of the cooler between 32 and 36. 
um, with high relative humidity for the strawberries. And of course, we'd like our strawberries to be as close to 32 as possible. Now, for good or bad, that cooler will tend to have a range of temperatures throughout it, um, and, and you can use this to your advantage. So, for example, by the door, the temperatures tend to be warmer uh, because you're going in and out on a relatively frequent basis. The back of the cooler tends to be colder. So I recommend that, first of all, that you get a, um, a good thermometer, you know, spend a little money on it, get a good thermometer, that you, that's, um, that you can calibrate by using ice water uh, to calibrate to 32. And then map out the temperatures in your uh, walk-in cooler at different times of the day and figure out where the coldest spot is. And that's where you want to put your strawberries. You do want, though, to make sure you don't have them in the direct airflow coming off the uh, condenser because um, with all that airflow, you can have uh, more water loss and uh, potentially you could get to temperatures that were too low for the strawberries. Also, uh, if you have a, uh, a thermometer um, or a thermostat in the room, um, it's important that uh, you use a good wall thermometer um, to, if you're going to be monitoring temperatures on a daily basis. So this is an example of a, of a back room. Um, and um, you'll notice if you go to the next slide, we have uh, some strawberries here in this oval, uh, different kinds of berries. And these are uh, pretty close to the door in this example. Here we see uh, perhaps better placement for the berries uh, near the back of the room. And in, in this case, they're out of the, um, the flow of air that's coming off the, the condensers here. So uh, good placement there. You want to make sure to make um, to have a well-maintained curtain in the doorway and maintain that in good condition to help reduce the influx of warm air. Keep the door to the cooler closed when you're not going in and out. And of course, in terms of storage of the berries, because you're dealing with a situation where you don't necessarily have the optimum temperatures, you want to try to order product according to the sales demand, of course, making sure that you don't run out of product. So this is just a, a photo of a well-maintained curtain. Um, of course, we've all seen pictures where the, the uh, curtain can be, has been cut off in the middle to make it easier to go in and out. But of course, in that case, you're, you're letting a lot of warm air in, so not uh, recommended. So here's an example of a beautiful uh, strawberry display certainly one that's going to attract customers who are going to um, want to buy strawberries. But for display, there's a bit of a challenge you have to balance um, between the desire to have that <clears throat> eye-appealing display and increase the sales, but at the same time the need to maintain low temperatures. And I think the key here is to rotate the product, uh, especially if you're using an unrefrigerated display where you're, you know, because of the placement uh, near traffic or the size of the display, uh, you want to check the display every couple of hours and rotate that product. And um, if the store is closed in the evenings, with especially with an unrefrigerated display, you want to move that product back to the walk-in cooler uh, during the off hours and bring it back out in the morning. Um, the refrigerated displays. Um, it's important to realize that those are designed to maintain temperatures between 36 and 38. They're not designed to cool product. And so it's really important that the product is thoroughly cooled uh, before it's put on display and that it's not allowed to sit out in the uh, produce area prior to stocking into the refrigerated display. You want to use the lowest set point possible on the display and again, you should verify that the supply air is between 32 and 35 using a calibrated thermometer. In terms of loading the display, you want to um, be aware of the airflow patterns and avoid overstocking that can disrupt the air curtain and also avoid blocking the return air vent. And I have a couple slides to show you what I mean. Uh, this is just showing uh, a nice example of a refrigerated display case for strawberries. Again, um, not, um, not designed to cool the product, but to maintain low temperatures. 
So uh, this is from uh, the Strawberry Commission's uh, Best Handling Practices brochure, and it shows basically uh, the pattern of airflow that you should see in a refrigerated display where the air is recirculating around and coming down across the top of the uh, packages. However, if you either block the return air vent, which we see on the top, in this case the air can't um, get into that return air vent, and so the unit has to pull fresh air from the store, which is not cold, into the unit, and so you're not going to maintain the lowest temperatures you'd like. Um, and in the bottom situation here, we've over, overstocked the uh, display, and so the air curtain that comes across the top is not able to circulate. If you're, this is one possible compromise um, situation where if you want to have uh, a, a large display um, in a, a high traffic area and a refrigerated display, uh, a typical refrigerated display doesn't work, these um, orchard bins um, do have some refrigeration capability. They're designed to maintain temperatures between 45 and 55. So obviously that's not our ideal, which would be closer to 32, but it's, it's cooler than the ambient conditions in the store, and it could be a compromise. Uh, would need more rotation than the refrigerated display. So just to mention, I talked a little bit about um, the need to have a good thermometer to map the temperatures in your walk-in cooler um, and, and also uh, to hang on the wall in there uh, and to measure the temperature of your refrigerated display. Um, the, our post-harvest website here under yellow pages has a, a nice list of sources of of these kind of temperatures, uh, temperature thermometers you can get, and also information on uh, optimum temperatures for storage of a, a wide range of products. So that wraps up my presentation, and if there's time, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Great job, Beth. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that there are a number of publications available, both from the Strawberry Commission and from UC Davis with regard to handling strawberries for fresh market. They're both very good, and they're both available from the Strawberry Commission and or uh, UC Davis. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Beth? Hi, Beth. Uh, great presentation. Uh, one question uh, I had with regards to returning berries to the cooler in the evening after they've been out on display. Uh, we were advised through food safety that that is not a good practice um, because once the berries have warmed up and you move them back into uh, refrigeration, um, moisture buildup can take place on the uh, the berries and that you can actually transfer bacteria at a higher rate by doing that. Uh, well, thank you for your question. Uh, it's a really good question and it's one I, I get very frequently, um, not only from retail but uh, other aspects of strawberry handling. Um, there have been a number of studies actually done on this and, and while the condensation and the moisture it certainly can be an issue for growth of, uh, of decay organisms um, that are already present on the strawberries. So main, I'm mainly here talking about fungi and that sort of thing. Um, the studies have shown that the more you can keep the fruit at low temperatures, the, the better the quality. And I would, and I'll ask Trevor to certainly chime in, but I would say in terms of if you had potential bacteria on the fruit, um, I think it would be better to be at lower temperatures than to be concerned about uh, possible condensation on the fruit. And Trevor, do you want to jump in on that? I guess or maybe you, Jim, you want to comment um, on that? Yeah, I, I, the, I guess the other question then would be, too, is that, that really there's probably a stronger recommendation that if we've done all of our work uh, to make sure temperature control was adhered to all the way through the cold chain process, and then we take that product and expose it at ambient temperature at retail pretty much uh, destroyed all the work in the past. I, I think you're right in that. I mean, it's, it's a cumulative thing, so, you know, you have, you have time and you have temperature. Right. And the more of each one of those things you have, the less quality and shelf life you have left. And so you have, even if you've maintained temperature really well, you have this time factor going, and then if you lose the temperature control at the end, you're, you're definitely going to compromise the quality that the consumer has at home. Sure. Trevor? Coming back to the issue of 
of sort of temperature change and condensation on the barriers. I think everything that that Beth said that that I heard was was accurate, and and it certainly is a, a trade off and a compromise. Most of the decay that you're going to get in the time frame uh, that we're talking about is largely infections that start, you know, someplace prior to to retail display. And although you might be able to stimulate um, some additional growth from things due to free moisture on the surface, mostly what you're trying to do is, is delay the growth of those Infections that may have already started, uh, which is you know just a normal thing. As far as the food safety or transfer of of organisms, I think primarily because you have them in the you know predominantly in clamshells these days. You know the issue of transferring among uh, individual packs is I think greatly greatly reduced. And then all of the data that that I'm uh, familiar with for strawberries would say that. Although, you know, survival is possible, you don't see growth on, a, on an intact berry with, say, bacteria of, of concern like E. coli. Uh, hello. I uh, just have a question with regards to storage of full pallets of berries once they're received into the distribution center. Um, we're just wondering, is it possible to store with the Tectrol bag still intact or is the uh, the respiration and the heat cost in the respiration, is that a detriment? The challenge with the Tectrol bags and the modified atmosphere bags is that um, they, they, they're they designed to work when air temperatures are kept consistently low at 32 degrees. So, you know, if there's a situation where you can guarantee that that, that pallet's going to be kept at 32 degrees, then there's a possibility you could do that. But generally speaking, um, we don't have that level of confidence of maintaining low temperatures at, at DCs. And so that's why the general recommendation is to take the bag off. Okay, so it would be it would be better off to not keep it on because, because of the increased uh, heat yeah, you just, generated you, by the berries. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The other issue is that with um, with all the extra handling, there's a possibility that the bag may have been compromised by a small tear and then you would have lost the atmosphere, and if that's the case, then you, you're not able to get that product cooled back down with that bag on there, and you don't have the protection of the atmosphere, and so that's, that's the other reason for that recommendation. And uh, we're going to move on now to Chris Christian, who's VP of Trade and Nutrition at the California Strawberry Commission. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the California Strawberry Commission is a state government agency that represents an industry of more than 500 growers and 60 shippers and processors. The Commission conducts programs in food safety, research in production and nutrition, trade relations, public policy, and marketing communications. Our industry shipped a record 146 million trays of fresh strawberries last year. We supply 87% of the fresh and frozen strawberries consumed in the U.S., and our total crop value is now over $2 billion. The California strawberry industry was one of the first in produce to develop food safety guidelines back in the late 1990s. Our industry received a wake-up call when California strawberries were wrongly associated in media reports with, in foodborne illness outbreaks from imported raspberries and imported frozen strawberries. These incidents caused major losses to California strawberry growers, over 20 million in 1996 and 11 million in 1997. The industry took action to develop guidelines for good agricultural practices with a primary focus of preventing microbial contamination of strawberries. Key components of the industry food safety program that address microbial contamination include guidelines for worker health and hygiene, field sanitation, soil and water testing. California has the most stringent regulations in the world on pesticide use, and pesticide safety is another aspect of our program. Product traceback is important in terms of isolating a potential issue to a specific field or location and thus minimizing impact on an entire industry. The California Strawberry Industry Food Safety Program has been recognized 
by the California Department of Public Health, the Department of Food and Agriculture, and FDA as one of the best in the industry. In addition to documentation and checklists used for operations and employee training in the field, the program includes guidelines for cooler operations and for maintaining food security on the farm. We in the California strawberry industry are proud of our safety record and our reputation for producing some of the highest quality and most delicious berries in the world. But we recognize that an incident can occur at any time and could be very damaging to our industry. That's why um, even before the outbreaks uh, that made headlines uh, associated with spinach in 2006, the Commission Board of Directors confirmed that an exceptional food safety and security program remains the top priority of the California Strawberry Commission. We continue to work actively to improve industry practices and to maintain communication with local, state, and federal regulators. We sponsor seminars during the year that bring growers and shippers face-to-face -face with regulators so they can learn about the newest requirements and also get their questions answered. We are also engaged in the ongoing discussions in Washington on national food safety requirements for produce. So what are we doing now in 2008 to improve food safety in the California strawberry industry? This year, a team of Commission staff, along with outside food safety experts, is assessing industry practices, from the nurseries that produce our strawberry plants, all the way through to the various customer and consumer distribution points for our fruit. This year-long project is going to help us identify ongoing needs for training and education, any potential risks specific to strawberry production, and food safety research needs um, to address any risks that we may identify. The Commission has also increased the number of staff members who are dedicated to working with growers on food safety communication. Uh, we are, have identified staff members in each of our major production regions, Salinas, Watsonville, <coughs> excuse me, Santa Maria, and Oxnard. Our goal throughout this year and every year is to contact each grower to learn about their individual needs and help them implement food safety programs in the field. We are also continually improving the training tools that we create for our industry members to use. We've learned over the years that visual aids created in Spanish and in English are the most effective tools to help growers train employees and to use as ongoing reminders in the field. From hand washing posters to information on pesticide safety and also the do's and don'ts of field sanitation, these types of materials are used widely throughout our industry. The Commission uh, is also developing training videos designed to encourage industry members to take the next step on making food safety part of the everyday culture of producing strawberries. Um, in the California strawberry industry, we believe guidelines and documentation are important, but they are only part of an exceptional food safety and security program. That's why the Commission is actively working with growers, shippers, and processors to provide the training and support they need to continue to deliver the safest strawberries to our customers. Um, thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, my presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, I'll start off with a question, Chris. This is Jim Gorney. Uh, basically, how are you trying to? How are you going to get all this great educational information out to the growing community with regard to best practices for food safety? Um, well, as I've mentioned, Jim, uh, you know we recognize the importance of being able to connect with industry members, and that's why we have uh, created new positions for uh, food safety specialists. Um, in our production districts. And these individuals will be charged with um, communicating and helping growers implement food safety programs uh, out in their fields and will be based locally in each of our major growing areas. Chris, uh, you, you went through a few of those outbreaks. Have California strawberries ever been associated with a foodborne illness outbreak? No, they have not. We have, as I mentioned, been impacted by outbreaks um, in imported raspberries and imported strawberries, but California strawberries themselves have not been associated. And, and what do you think one of the most important aspects of this overall food safety program that the Strawberry Commission has implemented, what, what do you think the most important aspect is? 
Um, the most important aspects of our guidelines um, are those that relate to worker health and hygiene and to field sanitation. Uh -huh. uh, we consider those areas critical for uh, preventing uh, microbial contamination of the fruit. Question, Chris. The, uh, the educational outreach is ongoing, is it not? Yes, the, the educational outreach has been going since the guidelines were first developed uh, back in the late 90s. Um, you know, last year we, we've contacted growers via phone and, and we're taking the next step now um, to kind of reinforce some of the on-the-ground outreach that was done in earlier years uh, by having communication specialists in each region. So our goal this year is to get to every grower, and that's over 500 growers in our industry. A question to Chris or Jim Gorney. Uh, what is currently considered the highest risk in the strawberry growing and harvesting? As I mentioned, I think the most important aspect of what we do is, is our focus on worker health and hygiene and field sanitation. Um, we consider those to be the highest potential risk areas at this time, and that is why we, we focus very strongly on those as part of our guidelines. I'd agree with Chris completely. I think worker health and hygiene is probably the key issue because of the way California strawberries are grown with regard to being on plastic culture uh, and also the uh, low water uh, use, of the drip irrigation line. So uh, worker health and hygiene, and they are hand each individual berry is handled by an employee who picks it and packs it. Thank you. I was just uh, curious if there's a list available of the growers that have come on side with you for your food safety programs. Um, we actually uh, we don't provide lists of growers, but we do provide lists of all the shippers and processors who um, who handle California strawberries, and those lists are publicly available. Um, basically, our we uh, work with our entire industry, and we work uh, especially well through the shippers and processors to conduct outreach and support their efforts with their growers. Do we have another question? Uh, yes, does the Commission's food safety program uh, fall within the criteria or protocol for either EuroGAP or World GAP certification? Some aspects of it will fall within, um, but not all aspects of it. Um, EuroGAP and some of these other programs uh, contain some different uh, criteria um, and also include, uh, in many cases, more than food safety. Um, they include a number of things on sustainability and also uh, more quality assurance type of measures. Um, but certain aspects of our program do fall within your gap. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. If there's uh, no other questions, I'd like to thank again the California Strawberry Commission for this opportunity to collaborate with them. I'd also like to thank all my colleagues, Jim Thompson, Trevor Suslow, and Beth Mitchum for their uh, active participation. And uh, we look for, please visit our websites where there's more information available. And uh, have a wonderful day.